It's about the doctor and it's about the teams. It's not about anything else. And so we are very happy being a support organization and therefore we don't need to be a lead brand, right? We can be a kind of a, a powered by small doctors brand or a, a brand that's in the background that enables the success of our affiliate doctors. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Glenn Krieger here with another uh, episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. And today we are truly fortunate uh, to bring somebody in who's not in the ortho world as an orthodontist, but somebody who has direct influence on many of our lives. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jay Hedrick, uh, CEO of Smile Doctors. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Dr. Krieger. Uh, glad to be here. Great to talk to you today. You know, he's being very modest here. Um, he's being very kind. He doesn't have to. He knows me as Glenn. And so you can call me Glenn here, Dr. <laughs> Hedrick. I appreciate it. But um, let me just give everybody some background real quickly, whether they know it or not at this point in the game. Myself and my partners, Michael Rasmussen and uh, Douglas Shaw, we joined and partnered with Smile Doctors about, oh, three months ago. And it's been a fantastic journey for us. But just recently, in the last week to 10 days, there's been a really exciting uh, event, a private equity event with Smile Doctors that we'll get into in a little bit. And I felt, uh, who better to bring on here than the CEO of the company? And I really appreciate you being with us here today, Jay. So thank you. No, really excited to, to talk about it and, uh, and chat with you today. It's exciting times here at Small Doctors. So yeah, it's excited to talk is. about it. Yeah. And you know, I, I also think that it's very rare where people have an opportunity to really pull up a chair and, uh, and get to learn from somebody who's in your position. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, CEOs don't grow on trees. I mean, you hear the term bantered about. But, and we'll get into your history in just a second, but I, I really felt that this was a great opportunity and I appreciate the access to be able to pick your brain a little bit about things like uh, private equity, uh, how private ev equity events happen, uh, the role of private equity in orthodontics in general, and to sort of uh, get rid of some of the myths that are out there about what goes on and for people to have a better understanding. And at the end of this, I think if people are less scared of the role of private equity in our profession and better understand it, I think that's better for everybody. So thank you again for access. Thank you again for taking the time. I can't imagine how busy you are. So let's get you started with, if you don't mind, how does one become a CEO, right? I have no plan, so your job is safe, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, yeah, I know. I know you're really, <laughs> everybody out there is really, really gunning for you. Um, but seriously, how does one you know, I assume you don't wake up when you're seven years old and go, I'm going to be a CEO. I know a little bit about your background, but if you can explain to everybody, how did you get to where you are right now? No, thanks. Uh, I don't know. I might've been the kid who did wake up at seven years old and say that's what I <laughs> wanted to do. Uh, but, you know, I, I got into it because I have a passion for working with people and figuring out what makes things work and how you can create win-win opportunities and drive businesses. And so I'm an industrial engineer by trade. I went to Georgia Tech or by education, um, started out doing some consulting and then got into operations. And I did that in, in many different functions. I started in the convenience store industry and really realized that what, what drives businesses are the people inside of them, right? And, and the goods and services that are sold are, are important. But at the end of the day, it's the culture, it's the type of people, it's the way you uh, enable their success that really is the differentiator of businesses. And, and it's what really matters at the end of the day. And so I found this passion for um, trying to find what we call the three greens, right? Something that's a win for the team, for the shareholders, and for the consumers, right? And where right. you can find something that's a win-win-win, you've got something really special and something that's uh, that's really unstoppable. So I, I was able to work my way up in management through the convenience store industry, through a couple of different jobs. And then I decided to pivot and I went into the restaurant industry. So you went from serving Slurpees to people and now then you became a server, right? You're working in the restaurant. Just industry. serving pizza, right? At Pizza yeah. Hut and <laughs> burgers at Wendy's. That's exactly yeah. what I did. And listen, I've, I've run a, uh, a fry line with the best of them. Actually, I've run a fry line, not with the best of them. I'm not that good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been down there and, and done it. I get in people's way is really what happens. But um, really started to, to understand, you know, again, it's, it's about serving the team, serving the customer, figuring out how you, how you differentiate. And at that point in time, I uh, was in franchise businesses. And so it was all about operations and execution and enabling your team because you weren't even creating the product. Then I moved in and I became the CEO of a business called Payway, which was uh, P.F. Chang's Fast Casual that was a private equity-backed business. And I um, 
ran that for a couple of years, and then we were able to successfully sell that business. I then was able to take a look at what was out there, and that's what led me to Smile Doctors, and it's been an amazing two years since I've been here. Yeah, and for those people out there who uh, have never had a chance to spend any real time with you, I just want to tell them, Jay is just such a humble human being. Uh, the opportunity to sit and chat and learn from him has been remarkable. I remember at the uh, annual Smile Doctors meeting, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and we were standing in the, in the lobby uh, by the elevators, and he literally gave me about an hour of his time really explaining to me the private equity world and how things work and understanding it. And, and again, to me, that was really important to understand that this is the guy running our ship, uh, and somebody who's had a, a track record of success. And so kudos to you for the humility you bring to the job. I know that it's a great organization. There's no question about that the, the folks who started this knew what they were doing. But, but was there something about the culture? Was there something about the organization that drew you to Small Doctors? Was there something about it that was different than just the business opportunity? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, it was interesting when I, when I sat down and in 25 years, I hadn't had the opportunity going to say, what do I want to do when I grow up? Right. Um, right. And to openly look for another job. And everything had been a little bit secretive when you're doing that. And um, at this point in time, I was able to sit down and say, what really matters to me, right? I want something that is a mission-driven business, something that's doing great things in the lives of the consumer. And in our case, it's the patient, but in the consumer at the time. And something that has a great cultural foundation, you know, that bedrock of culture. It's a, it's an overused term or it's an often misunderstood term and, uh People say it's the panacea of everything, it feels like, but they don't really uh, often dig in and realize what it takes and, and what a differentiated culture is. And so as I went through things that, that I thought were important for long-term sustainable success, uh, I was fortunate enough to have several different opportunities in front of me as I decided what I wanted to do next. And Smile Doctors was the one that checked all the boxes. You know, from the founders and the founding doctors, they had a core vision of love people first, straighten teeth second. They wanted to make their team's lives better. They wanted to empower their teams to do more, right? And they led with such a, a level of humility and service while still being very smart and very driven. And that's a hard culture to have. And, and when it's in the DNA, it's incredibly powerful. And so... What I've used with others is I felt like getting the opportunity to join Smile Doctors was getting the opportunity to join Chick-fil-A or Southwest Airlines back when they were just barely bigger than a startup. You know, it had that much of a differentiated culture. I, I did not feel like the folks who did this business got in it strictly to, you know, make money. We're all in this to make money. We're all in this to do well. I did not feel like that was objective number one for the people who started the business. They wanted to protect the specialty of orthodontics. They wanted to make sure that patients were taken care of. They wanted to make sure their teams were taken care of. And they felt like by doing well by all those key stakeholders, okay, then they would do well and, and everyone who joined them would do well. And the doctors who followed the original doctors who got together um, all shared in that same vision. And that's really... How the business has been built is by trying to find people that have that same mentality, that same vision, that same passion for serving the patient and serving their teams and building the organization that way. I think it's incredibly special. I also think it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, um, what's interesting is that I speak to a lot of doctors and anybody who knows me knows I really do try to maintain objectivity when I talk about things. And I don't want this podcast today to just simply be about us, you know, talking about, yay, smile doctors, we're amazing. <laughs> I expect to get grilled, I know. Oh, yeah, we want, <laughs> just, you know, I can grill with the best of them, right? Um, just like going back to your food service uh, reference. But, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we're going to hit a couple of topics here, but it's important for anybody out there who's even considering joining uh, an OSO or a DSO that I try to explain to people that when you get offers, uh, having been through this myself and having spoken to literally dozens of, if not hundreds of people who've been through it, you're going to get offers from different private equity groups if, if, or different companies if you speak to them. But, but it's not about the money because unless there's something really wonky most of the offers are going to be within some sort of range of one another. You know, you're not going to get an offer and another company is going to offer you 2X. You know, you know, here's a million dollars or we're going to give you $2 million. It doesn't work like that, right? Things are generally close enough that it's important to understand that when you look, if you're listening or watching, 
you need to ask about the culture of the organization, right? Culture and onboarding. To me, those are the two intangibles that you need to ask about when you're thinking of joining an OSO or DSO because those transcend money. If I said to you, your life is going to be a living hell once you get on board, you can have somebody living in your back pocket, uh, henpecking or badgering you every day about your numbers. Is that worth a half a million dollars over the next five years? Maybe not, right? So the culture um, and the onboarding are huge because if, if the onboarding is smooth, that's wonderful. How many people have they brought on? What is the culture? And I will, I'm going to give a shout out here, Jay, to probably one of your favorite people in the world. Because when we onboarded, and there's so many good people I can talk about in so many organizations, in, in many PE run groups, I can tell you some great people, but I'm going to call out Dr. Greg Goggins, all right? You know exactly who I'm talking about here. And Greg, I'm sorry, because you're the kind of guy who's going to get embarrassed by me calling you out. Um, but former state senator out of Georgia, he's in charge of onboarding, right? At Smile Doctors. And when he came to our office, he is the most positive, upbeat, living everything you just spoke about. And I think I would get a, like a affirmation text from him every morning for like a month and a half. And I got to tell you, one of the things that drew us to Smile Doctors was the onboarding process. And I want to tell everybody out there, uh, you don't have to join Smile Doctors. That's not the point of this. What I want to get out there is whoever you're planning on joining, you must ask about their culture and you must ask about their onboarding. Because if you ask them about their culture and they go, I don't know what you're talking about, culture. You know, we're in this to win it. That's not really a culture, right? And if you say, what about the onboarding? And they say, well, we've got a pretty good onboarding process. You might want to question that one as well. So again, you can always reach out to me with questions and I can explain to you what that is more. But Jay referenced it and I wanted to jump in there and say culture is so important. And now, Jay, you came on board about two years, right? You said? Two years ago, yes. Right, yep. and, and shortly after you came on board, there was a change in the cultural way that you approached it the partnering with other offices, right? Um, I remember two, three years ago when we first heard the word Smile Doctors, we were told that if you join the Smile Doctors network, your practice became called Smile Doctors, your phone was answered Smile Doctors, Smile Doctors was on the wall, your team wore Smile Doctors, it was all Smile Doctors events. And then suddenly, about probably six months to a year after you joined, I remember Ben, ben Fishbein joining and he got to stay Ben Fishbein. And all of a sudden my eyes opened up and I said, wait a minute, do we not become a Smile Doctors company? Do we get to maintain Krieger or Shaw orthodontics? Uh, is that what happens? And so do you mind talking a little bit about what happened there and, and why that change occurred? Yeah, sure. I think um, anytime you want to be the best organization you can be, you've got to self-scout, right? And you've got to look at some of the things that you're doing that are very good. And there, there are many things that Small Doctors has done very well, like I said, the culture uh, from the very beginning. And then there were other things that, that weren't seen as positives, either to the consumer or to our, our doctors that were joining us. And one of those was the branding decision. Another one of those was not having an affiliations integration. You mentioned Dr. G. You know, Greg is absolutely incredible at what he does. And, and the fact that we have the size and scale to be able to dedicate an entire team that helps our new affiliations for the first six to 12 months that they're part of Smile Doctors and to ease that transition. You know, we, we hear from a lot of groups, we don't want to change anything. And I will tell you what we learned at, at Smile Doctors is it takes a lot of time and practice to figure out how to not change anything and not break it. Because you do have to change things, right? Your payroll comes together, benefits come together. There are certain things that you want changed. You know, you want someone else doing the, the back end work on some of it, but to do that while without disrupting um, what happens in the location takes some reps and it, uh, it takes some trial and error. And we were able to recognize the things we were doing that worked and the things that we were doing that we could do better. And so we've tried to implement some of those things, including bringing Greg in to lead our affiliations team, not focusing on a rebranding initiative. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we want to be a support. And that's that's the other thing. Myself and the leadership team here, we recognize that we we don't create any revenue, okay? We don't treat any patients. We don't make any patients' lives better. The only thing we do is make our doctors and teams' lives better if we do our job well, okay? And it's it's about the doctor and it's about the teams. It's not about anything else. And so we are very happy being a support organization and therefore we don't need to be a lead brand, right? We can be a kind of a, a powered by Smile Doctors brand or a, a brand that's in the background that enables the success of our affiliate doctors. And that's yeah. that's we're very happy with that. And we think that's the right place for us to play. 
I agree. And I think it's important for anybody considering joining any group to ask that question. I know you're going to give me this big lump sum of money, but how are you going to make my life easier? Right? That's a very fair question. And I, I can tell everybody out there, at least from my experience of joining Smile Doctors, you know, we've had technology that we've been allowed to bring on board. Right. We've talked about things like dental monitoring and and and, you know, I, I, I realize at this moment I don't want to get into brands per se, but I've been given the green light myself and my partners to, you know, explore new technologies that we can bring into our office to make us more efficient, to make the patient experience better. Um, and again, that's another question you should ask if you're thinking about joining any partner is to ask them, you know, once I come on board, can I can I do more aligners uh, irrespective of brand? Can I, can I do some remote monitoring softwares to bring them into my office? Can I use a specific bracket that I've always wanted to use? And on top of that, I've heard a rumor, don't know if it's true, Jay, and, and maybe you don't want to talk about it, uh, but that maybe there's some assistance at times with doctors who are trained in ClinChecks to help doctors on their pathway to ease their load, shall we say. Are you at, are you at liberty to talk about that on any level? Yeah, I mean, I think we can talk about that. We want to remove obstacles from our doctors, right? That's that's what we do. One of those obstacles is as you transition, um, and, and we are really happy if you're a traditional bracket and wire business. We are really happy if you are mostly in the digital ecosystem. But we do we do talk to some practices that are currently more of a bracket and wire traditional business, but would love to transition to more of a digital ecosystem. The pandemic has uh, has shown some of the values of doing that with remote monitoring and less visits in office. Um, But for a period of time, it's almost like you're running two different businesses, right? You're running your traditional business while you transition. And we have trained doctors that are central that utilize um, really the doctor's preferences along with some, uh, some best practices that have been created internally. The doctor has final say, right? In clinical decisions, but we can generate that clin check for them centrally Okay, and then the doctor approves it. And can okay, I? Can but I it just... is a doctor, doctor done clin check that then the orthodontist in the location has the uh, has the final approval. I, I just want to jump in there and dial down on that one, just for a tiny little drop because this is huge. Because clin checks take up the lives, the private lives of many orthodontists who've gone digital, right? Who've gone with a lot of uh, aligners. You know, they're working afternoons, lunches between patients, uh, evenings, weekends on clin checks. So to reiterate what you just said, there are trained doctors, not assistants, not technicians, but doctors who are trained on clin checks to do a lot of the heavy lifting so that the doctor in the clinic can simply look at it and go, yeah, those are my preferences. It's set up the way I want it to look. You've done the job as I would have done it. Approve, right? And so to take the stuff that's not their high energy, high expertise, high value, for why they're there and put it on someone else's plate, a doctor who's happy doing that, which is really huge. And, and I think there's a second component to that that's really worth exploring, which is the value of making someone's life easier when you partner with somebody, right? And so this is what I'm trying to throw out there to people to think about is when you onboard, ask this question. And I'm not saying it's about smile doctors. I'm saying it's about your journey, whoever you are. Ask the partners you are talking to as not just how much money you're going to give me and not just about the culture, but what exact things do you have that are going to make my life easier and allow me to do the things that I'm really good at and to spend time with my family and enjoy it. Because I tip my cap to the fact that that Smile Doctors is doing that because it wasn't something I even knew about when I came on as a partner. And all of a sudden, people start talking about it. And, and the most important thing to take away from this that you said in like three words that I don't think people understand is when you join anybody, the network of doctors you join is arguably one of the more important things as well. Because what you said, Jay, is they use the preferences of the doctor and best practices that have been determined. Well, where do those best practices come from? From some of the people in the Smile Doctors Network who are literally doing thousands of Invisalign cases per year who understand how to get these things done the right way and are able to impart their knowledge as part of your network, as your partner doctor, to help run that system better, right? That's right. And and we're extremely proud of our doctors. And we have some amazing doctors in all sorts of different ways. We have amazing doctors with bracket and wire. We have amazing doctors who are, are doing plastic. And so you have that network. You have the ability to reach out to them through teams. You can get consulting from them on any individual case. And then we also can embed that in the overall kind of uh, preferences that come out. 
Yeah, and the, and that that illustrates again when you join an OSO or DSO, the power of the network is going to play a huge role. Are you joining with people who are going to elevate you? Who are or are you the biggest fish in the pond? And you're going to be elevating everybody else. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you should know that this is a valid question to ask if you're looking to join an OSO or a DSO out there. And again, you can always reach out to me. I can help illustrate this in other ways. But with the time we have left, I want to hit the deal a little bit because everybody's talking about this. Everybody hears it. And and quite honestly, right now, this is technically Smile Doctor's third private equity event in, in, in its years of existence. And as far as I know, to date, there is no other or OSO. There have been many DSOs, but there's no other OSO that's even had one deal. And so I'd like to use the history of Smile Doctors to sort of use real, real examples of what private equity is all about. And so if you want to just summarize real quickly, what was the deal that Smile Doctors just went through? And then I'll have a couple of follow-up questions about that. Yeah, sure. We're really excited about this most recent um, investment into Smile Doctors. We have an amazing financial sponsor in Linden Capital Partners. Linden is the uh, largest healthcare only private equity firm in the United States. And so, you know, we've been we've been fortunate to be with them. We are extremely excited because they are going to remain on board as a equal joint partner with TH Lee. And TH Lee is one of the largest private equity firms in the United States. They're out of Boston. They are also one of the oldest uh, private equity firms. They've been around for four decades. And they have been incredibly successful in their track record. What's, you know, to us, you also have to look at the culture of who's sponsoring you. Because if someone's going to come in and they want to value engineer everything, or they don't understand that you're a doctor-driven culture and that you have to keep doctors at the forefront of all the decision making, and that changes the, the lens through which you look at things. And so it's so important to bring on partners that also recognize what the secret sauce is of your organization. And TH Lee is absolutely fantastic in that regard. We felt an immediate uh, cultural connection with them. We love their track record. We think they bring a lot of things that will make myself and the management team better. They bring a track record of knowing how to continue to to increase value. And and when we increase value, remember, our business is still uh, significantly owned by our affiliate doctors. They are very, very large shareholders and, and collectively you know, a third of the business, give or take, is is owned by our doctors. And so we want to maximize the value for our, for our doctors that are in the in the network as well. And so making sure that we partner with someone who understood the doctors and who could also help us grow value the right way. TH Lee has always been a growth investor. They've done it successfully for many years. They only have three verticals that they they look at, one of which is healthcare. And so they understand who we are and what our DNA is. And partnering them with Lyndon, uh, who's been an exceptional partner for the last four years, we feel just very blessed about where we ended up and uh, couldn't, be, couldn't be kind of more excited, more proud and feel like we have, uh, you know, if we, were, uh, if we were kind of cooking with gasoline, now we feel like we're cooking with jet fuel right nice. now at Smile Doctors. That's awesome. And, and so the valuation of Smile Doctors that came out through all of this was about $2.4 billion with a B, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. It, and so there's only, I think there's only two other DSOs uh, or th- no OSOs because no other OSO has had a private equity event as far as I know. But there's two other, D- only other two other DSOs, which are massive, have ever had a higher valuation than what we're talking about here. And I think they're Heartland and Aspen, which are just humongous, right? But for those out there who don't understand when we talk about a private equity event, um, can you just like real quickly explain what is private equity? I think most orthodontists grew up without even knowing. We know the term, but we don't know what it is. And, and what is a private equity event? When, when Linden Capital took over or bought whatever term we want to use, Smile Doctors, what is that like? What happens? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you have basically two different markets, right? So if you own a business and you want to get bigger, you know, I guess you have three different avenues. You could go to your local bank and borrow money. Uh, and that's going to have limitations to it. Or if can I have two billion dollars, please? Yeah, I mean, if you go to the teller, they might they might <laughs> they might think you're trying to rob in hundreds, uh, in hundreds, please. <laughs> um, most banks aren't going to be able to pull that off, uh, at least not not in a day or so. But um, you know, so so you can raise money to grow through a bank. You can also raise money to grow if you're on the other side by going to the public markets. 
And then in between, there's private equity. Private equity is led by a general partner. And, and when we refer to um, TH Lee or Linden or other groups, that's the general partner. And the general partner goes out and they raise funds from private investors where limited partners. And those limited partners back the general partner, the TH Lee or the Linden. So they give them money or they give them commitments for money. And they then allow the general partner to invest on their behalf. And so it pulls money from pension funds or from you know large private wealth. But a lot of times it's actually uh, retirement funds and pension funds and things like that. And you're, you're really helping them get above market returns, which is pretty cool too. I think people think it's all um, super rich individuals that are only investing on their behalf. And it's not. A lot of times these are public funds that are being done for, for teachers or for firefighters or for things like that. And they're being invested into these funds. And it's our job to make sure that we're good stewards of those funds and provide them a return. But Linden or TH Lee, they raise money from these limited partners. They pull them together. They become the general partner and they make an investment in business. And there are different private equity groups, just like everything else. But Linden and TH Lee, they want to invest in good businesses with differentiated business models that they believe will grow and will continue to grow and uh, will sustainably grow. Right. And, and what everybody's heard also is things about, you know, equity, right? We all hear the word equity. And, uh, and equity is, I, I guess you're the fancy CEO. I could give a definition, but it would probably be way off. What is the quick definition of equity? Yeah, equity is the value of the business less debt, right? And so it is pretty simple. And so the equity in the business is, is the net value of the business. Right. So if you have a $2.4 billion business with a billion dollars in debt, I'm just making up numbers. This is not Smile Doctors. You'd have equity of $1.4 billion, right? And so. And then if you had a thousand shares or a hundred shares, right, that would be the value per share. Right. And so. What's really important, what I wanted to get out here, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but what I wanted to get out is when I talk to people about joining an OSO, they'll call me, they'll text me, message me and say, hey, Glenn, I was thinking about partnering with an OSO, but I didn't want to join that. You know, they're referring generally to Smile Doctors because I heard they're about to have an event or they just had an event. And, you know, they feel somehow like that when an event happens, when another company buys or buys in, that suddenly the value is no longer there. Like they're starting at zero, right? And that I'm going to go join another one that's got, you know, that's never done one before because I'm going to get 2X, 4X, 8X, 12X on my equity that I'm, I'm sharing in there. And you and I both giggle a little bit because we understand how this all works. Um, there's two components. The first one is what I've been taught is the earlier something is in its, in its infancy, the, the more risk there is because they've never been through an event. So there's a higher promise of a bigger return, just like a penny stock. Uh, if you invest a lot of money in penny stock, you could hit it a home run, right? You could become a millionaire or you could be broke because it doesn't get there. So you're offered more reward for more risk. But, and typically in the lifespan of a private equity run company, the more events that occur, typically the lower the multiple goes because the risk goes down. Like a, a Smile Doctors is a less risky venture right now than a startup. If I said tomorrow, hey, Jay, come be my CEO. I have a brand new idea. I'm going to run a new OSO. We'd be much riskier than a Smile Doctors that's been through a couple of equity events before. But can you explain to somebody out there why a company, because every company, hopefully, we all want everybody to win, right? right. When hopefully other companies go through their equity events, why should one not look at that and go, oh, well, they just went through an equity event. I don't want to join them. That's a, you know, I'm going to go find one that hasn't been through one or has another, you know, is, is going to go through one in six months. Can you explain why? Because you've heard a lot of that, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a common misconception. But on the public markets, every single day, you know, on every single trade, they're marking their, their stock to market. Okay. Right. An event just codifies and solidifies the market. Now, every, I believe, not every, but I would say the vast majority of private companies also change their share price over time. They're just not getting a third-party valuation of it. So even if you join a, a business two years in and they haven't had an event, the odds are their share price has moved up internally. The internal market has moved up from where it was day one. Okay, so all this is is an exiteration of this. But also, you know, I would look at it if somebody wanted to join Smile Doctors tomorrow, which I hope a lot of people do because it's an incredible opportunity. I would say we just had some of the smartest people in the world 
uh, that are financially minded and growth minded look at our business and decide it's an incredible investment at this value, right? right? And they they are putting hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars of valuation in at that level, okay? And so if it's a great investment for them at this level, it's probably a pretty pretty good, pretty safe investment for you. And you're right, it's a risk versus a reward thing. But um, you know, the good news is we're still fairly early stage. Right, we have had a couple of different transactions, but we still have an incredible runway for growth. We have a huge opportunity in front of us, and again, the business has been fully diligenced by numerous outside parties, and has has come through very strong to where people and, and we had multiple multiple offers of people saying that they were excited in this kind of valuation range to to partner with small doctors. So um, there are a lot of people out there that that think it's a really great investment at this price. I agree. And it's just a mark to market. And then there will be a, uh, you know, it'll be what we do with it from here. But uh, I think the future is very, very bright. Yeah. And I'm going to let you go in just a second. But what I want to do is just sort of explain just a little bit about your answer, which is don't think of private equity events in any company. And again, this isn't just about Smile Doctors. This is about any private equity backed company. Do not think about it as happening in giant leaps. It's not as if you join on day one. And people join on in year two, in year three, in year four and five. And then in the fifth year, there's an equity event. All of a sudden, everybody comes along at the same price. And then everybody's back to start and nothing happens for five years. What Jay is saying is that treat it like a stock because that's how it works. You know, you've got a share price that starts at a certain number and it goes up and it goes up and it goes up and it goes up. So if you join on day one, it might be worth $100 a share. By the time the first equity event happens, it could be $500 a share. So if you joined six months before that equity event, you're not getting it $100 a share. You're getting it at $450 a share. Or, right, you'll see a nice growth, but you're not joining. And all of a sudden, if they got triple, you're not getting triple when you joined up over here, right? And so it's important for people to understand that when an event happens, so what if you didn't get Microsoft at $7 or $15 or $30 or $50? If Microsoft is going to trade at 200 or 220 250 300 later on, and you have the opportunity to get it at 75, get it at 75. It would right. be silly to say, I'm not getting in because they just uh, did a stock split. Like, really? I, that's a very good sign, you know, that they're growing. And so just for everybody out there who's not familiar, hasn't been through this process or doesn't understand private equity, just understand that irrespective of where you are on the spectrum of your equity event for whatever company you're looking to join, that should play a very small role. Now, there are exceptions to that, but generally speaking, an equity event coming is a good thing. An equity event that just occurred is a good thing because as Jay said, you've got some of the brightest minds out there spending literally millions upon millions of dollars to comb through the books of the company to verify that this is a legitimate investment. And so if that's happened, then you can be rest assured that somebody's looked over everything at every penny because you don't want to be the one who bought the company that was misrepresented on the books because that's not a good place. And so is there anything else you wanted to add, Jay? Any information we may have missed? Anything you want to talk about about uh, OSOs or private equity in general? I think the only thing we didn't talk about was the concept of when a company gets big enough and large enough to where uh, they no longer want to stay in private and want to go public, then the next step for them would be an, an initial public offering, right? An IPO. Right, right. So, and that can happen at different sizes, but obviously the larger you get, the fewer number of potential private sponsors are out there and the more attractive public markets look. And so that is an opportunity for businesses as they get bigger, depending on where the public markets are. And uh, certainly something I think every, uh, every business like ours that gets our size starts to look at and decide whether or not that's something that will make sense in the future. It's a, it's another very exciting opportunity. It opens up a lot more funding, right? There's a lot more money in the public markets than there is in the private markets. And so- um, And people tend to forget that because they think of a $60 billion company as having so much money. And then you look at cryptocurrency, for instance, just crypto in general, which is general amount of money in crypto today is over $2 trillion, just yeah, and Apple's it. Apple's approaching or, or is it, you know, almost three trillion dollars as an organization, right? I mean, it's it's pretty crazy the money that's out there in the public markets. Yeah, it really is. And so I know how busy your schedule is, and uh, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate you uh, steering our ship. And I say our because it's myself and the close to two hundred other smile doctors doctors out there. Um, I can tell everybody this. It doesn't happen all the time, but I've literally seen 
Jay Hedrick at dinners with doctors who are interested in joining Smile Doctors because Smile Doctors is not about whining and dining you at their fancy, uh, you know, pad, you know, their, their, their glass amazing room because they don't have that. If you look, he's got smooth walls, fluorescent lights and acoustic <laughs> ceiling tile above him in the, in the office. But I've seen this man actually sit at dinners with prospective doctors to talk about their partnership in Smile Doctors, which meant, m- means the world to me. And so if anybody out there wants to learn more, not just about Smile Doctors, but about my journey in the OSO world, I I always be objective. I'm a huge fan of this team, of my team, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily the right one for you. And to be honest, I know for a fact that not everybody who wants to be a partner in Smile Doctors ends up being a partner in Smile Doctors because you're very selective about them matching the culture, right? Yeah, you've got to you've got to protect that culture. And um, there are great people out there that may not be happy here. And it's part of our job because we know our culture really well, right? To both um, screen in for culture and screen out for culture. And I do love to go out and visit with doctors and see them where they are. We don't want to bring them into where we are. We don't, we don't spend a lot of money in our office. We'd rather spend it out where the patients are going to be and where the doctors are. It's a yeah. better use of everybody's money. But we do love to get out and see offices and see doctors and talk to them about what's really important to them. Because to your point, uh, Glenn, we want people to make the right decision for them. There is no upside in it for us to uh, hoodwink people into joining spa doctors and then being unhappy. And uh, that doesn't that doesn't work for anyone. And so it's really a big part of my job, of our business development job, of, of every one of our doctors who talk to other doctors and refer people and um, to make sure that uh, we put people in the right place. And if the right place is with small doctors, we're really excited and we want to have them. And if the right place isn't, then um, we'd love to get them in the right place or tell them, hey, let's talk in a year or two uh, when it makes more sense for you. Yeah. And, and the last thing I'm going to say out there to everybody who's listening or watching, if you're a part of Smile Doctors, you know exactly what we're talking about. But even if you're just looking, it never hurts for you to explore your options with OSOs. So there's no harm in if you think like, hey, my practice is such and such a size. Am I ready? Am I not ready? You can always call me and I can give you some insight and point you in the right directions. And as people who are listening right now can tell you, there have been many, many, many people who I've pointed to OSOs or DSOs that are not named Smile Doctors because I want to be objective and I want people to be happy. And so just thank you again, Jay, for your time here today. I can't thank you enough. Uh, really appreciate everything you're doing, not just for Smile Doctors, but with your transparency and, and helping everybody uh, who's out there in the OSO world. And uh, just thank you from the bottom of my heart. No, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed talking with you today. Yeah. And so again, anybody has a question for Jay, please reach out to me. I'll make sure I relay it to him. If you want to learn more about the space, like I said, Smile Doctors or any of the other ones out there, if I don't know the answer, I promise to put you in touch with somebody who does. Uh, But I will give you an honest and fair and objective uh, point of view from my perspective because it doesn't serve anybody well if you get fooled or bamboozled into joining something and then later on find it's not a good fit for you. So uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you, Jay, from the bottom of my heart. Everybody out there who's listening and watching, uh, please share this uh, because I think it's some valuable information. And if you have any questions about anything, just reach out to me because I'm always here to help you. Take care.